So uh, we're going to carry on with the uh, Madhupindika Sutta. And uh, we have come to this statement, which is very interesting. The mendicants, the judgments driven by proliferating perceptions beset the person. Uh, and I want to discuss a little bit what this means, because this is one of the kind of critical statements. Uh, and, uh, understanding this means that we understand a little bit about how perception works. Uh, and how we can then um, develop perceptions in the right way by uh, using our understanding of perception. Uh, and so this is a very famous phrase, the um, idea of behind proliferating, as I mentioned before, is papancha. And it's a kind of a famous word in the suttas that was uh, not really understood very well. And it, there was a book written by this uh, by a monk called Kattu Kurundanyanananda, very famous, quite a famous monk in Sri Lanka. And he wrote a book called Concept and Reality. Uh, and uh, this was about this idea of papancha. And uh, after he wrote it, it has been quite well understood what this means, this particular word. Uh, it's not so easy to understand in the suttas. Uh, but we get a rough idea. It's not that difficult to understand. So we still get an idea fairly easily what it, uh, what it refers to. So the idea of proliferation. Uh, you know what this word means in English? Uh, yeah, they are, you know, when you have a, it's really a, like a botanical term. It's a term used for plants usually. Uh, when we talk about the plant proliferating, it means like it grows out. Uh, and it's a bit like random. You know, you know when, they, when the plant grows, it's kind of called organic growth. It grows a bit there, it grows a bit here. The rock stops it from growing on that side. Something else stops it there. So proliferates like random and unstructured growth is what it means. Uh, and so this is the idea of it proliferating. It refers to plants normally. Uh, but uh, here, obviously, it refers to perception. So it means that perceptions that kind of grow and move in a kind of random, non-structured way, yeah? kind of going a bit this way, a bit that way, without any clear purpose, any clear goal, or any clear structure to them. Uh, so when we have proliferating perceptions, you can see it is not necessarily very good, right? It means that it's kind of, we don't really know what's going on. Uh, uh, and this is kind of the uh, issue at stake. If you want to have perceptions that have a certain direction, have a certain purpose, uh, that takes us towards the Dhamma, takes us towards Nibbana, takes us towards Samadhi, gives rise to wholesome qualities uh, and get rid of the unwholesome one. This is the idea of perceptions that are useful. Uh, you don't want to proliferate, you want to have useful perceptions. And so uh, this is uh, what we are what we are dealing with here. Now, if, if you think about your own perceptions, can you see how they sometimes are proliferating? When I mean perceptions here, I mean even like the thinking mind, how it kind of moves about. The Pali word here, apancha, sanya, sanka. Sanka is like um, notions or idea almost. So it's a bit like the thinking mind, yeah? So the thinking mind, the perceptions that we have moving, being driven on in a kind of random way. And if you think about your own experience of this, and I'm sure everyone has had this experience, uh, it is sometimes when you are, like, for example, you desire something. Uh, you take like you are gonna buy a new house or buy a new car or something like that. Uh, and then you think, uh, and then when you think about that, uh, can you see how that can take over your mind? Yeah, you think about it, you think about it, what it's going to be like, how you're going to make it look nice inside. And this is the idea when you keep on thinking about something you desire, going on and on and on like that, uh, this is papancha. Uh, yeah, it goes on and on. Or one very typical example of papancha is like relationships. Uh, yeah, if you fall in love with someone, you can think about that person endlessly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you know what I mean? It kind of there's no end to the thinking. And usually it is not very smart thinking. Yeah, usually this kind of thinking deluded in many different ways. Uh, and this is the idea of a papancha. It is driven by these desires underlying things. Yeah, it goes on and on and on. Uh, another, so this is the first driver of papancha, desire, tanha, craving in Pali language. Uh, another, another kind of driver of papancha is the, the conceit, I am. Yeah. If someone slights you, uh, if someone says something bad about you, uh, if someone kind of you makes you feel bad or puts you down or whatever, yeah, the mind again can think about this again and again and again. Why did I do that? That's bad. I shouldn't say this. It is not really true. Yeah. 
And even if they are just a fool, the other person, and they, you know you shouldn't take it seriously, what they say is very difficult sometimes to let go. Uh, and you think about, think about things. It doesn't really get you anywhere. Uh, this is sort of one of the uh, kind of strange things about thoughts, yeah? how we kind of go in circles all the time. We go round and round and round, coming back to the initial point. Uh, and a lot of that is just habitual. We're doing it because of habit. Uh, and so one of the most important things is, uh, as part of coming out of papancha is to not allow those habits to recur, uh, to come out of our habitual ways, uh, to see things, taking one step further back, uh, see things in a new way, and then understand through that letting go of this papancha that drives these things. So, so desire drives papancha, drives the thinking mind. Conceit drives the thinking mind. We're concerned about ourselves. And views, yeah, views also drive the thinking mind. So you can imagine if you have an argument with somebody, is there rebirth or is there no rebirth? Yeah? Which, which politicians are corrupt and which ones are okay here? Yeah? <laughs> I can take a lot of time, right? Politics can talk, talk about politics for a long, long time. I not get anywhere. I still get the same politicians anyway. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I, I feel bad about always saying bad things about politicians because it's, you know, they have their problems. Yeah, it is not easy to be a politician anywhere. The forces that work on you are incredibly strong. Yeah? And even if you are very young and you're idealistic and you want to do the right thing, and they will actually the force are so much stronger than you are. Uh, and so the best way, the best thing of politics is to kind of not make sure you don't become a politician yourself because the system is so strong uh, that you're going to be formed according to that system, regardless of how, or not, maybe not entirely regardless, but almost regardless of how idealistic you are. Uh, so we should have compassion for the politicians as well, you know. And we should rejoice every time there is a good one. Say, wow, there's a good one. Yay. He withstands or she withstands the pressures of you know, the world around them. Wow, that's amazing. And if you're really lucky to get some people like that who withstand the things of the world, like the Buddha, in a sense. And this is the beauty and the power of the Buddha, the ability to withstand all the conditioning of society around him and say that I don't want to follow the Brahmin Brahmanical Brahminical line of doing things. Uh, I don't want to follow uh, these other religions, the Jains or whatever. I'm going to do things my own way. Uh, this is kind of one of the things that is so amazing about the Buddha, which makes him such a powerful person. Uh, the ability to step back and not accept anything in the world and go entirely his own way. Uh, we all know how difficult it is to go our own way sometimes. Yeah? We know the pressures from family, from friends, from society, kind of Sometimes we just say yes because, okay, the pressures are too strong. You can't really say no. Uh, we don't really want to say yes, but okay, okay, in this case, we'll do it anyway. Uh, so this person who is able to withstand that, it is worthy of so much respect, yeah? Because you're following truth, always truth, always truth. Uh, not allowing things to kind of hold you back just because they are accepted by society. Uh, this is kind of the Buddha. So we need more Buddhas in the world. Uh, this is kind of the thing, yeah. So who's going to become the next Buddha? <laughs> we have to look at it has to be some of us right we has to we have to do it and if not buddhas at least we can become arahants or at least dream enters at least we can get some good samadhi at least we can have more mindfulness at least we can be more kind at least we can be more generous we start with the simple ones at least we can start with more generosity and kindness yeah that's where we start so this is what the proliferating perceptions mean and uh, the, these uh, ideas and notions uh, driven by the defilements of the mind, uh, driven by all of these underlying things uh, that are always there in our minds. Uh, yeah? And so um, this is what we are up against. Uh, and now you can see also a large part what the solution is. The solution is to overcome these things somehow. And of course, the way to overcome these things is going to be the Noble Eightfold Path. No surprise there. Uh, and you will see here the way it is phrased here. Yeah? These things beset the person. Yeah? Samudacharanti, yeah? is I think is a Pali word. Uh. So it is not when you have all of these things happening in your mind, all this papancha, all this proliferation, uh, it is not really your fault. Uh. Yeah? Isn't that nice to think? Uh? Not, not your fault. You're okay here. Uh. Yeah, you are the victim of this thing. That's why it means they beset the person. You are the victim of these perceptions. They happen to you. And this comes from the Buddhist idea of non-self. If you are non-self, how can you be responsible if there's no self? 
possible. It's just cause and conditions coming together. The person you are right now is the sum total of these cause and conditions. So when you proliferate, when your mind proliferates, you can forgive yourself. You can kind of let go. You can, it's okay. You don't have to be the perfect Buddhist. You're going to have sometimes bad desires. Sometimes you're going to have stupid desires. Sometimes you may have a bit of ill will. Sometimes you may have all these things. Yeah? This is what it means to be human. And it's okay. Yeah? One of the great things about Buddhism is this ability of self-forgiveness. This follows as a consequence of non-self. Yeah? It's a beautiful way of thinking about yourself. Yeah? We are victims of our own conditioning, of our own past. And this is why these proliferating perceptions happen. You are, they beset you. You are a victim of these things. So we want to come out of being victims. We want to be in charge of our own minds. So how do we become in charge of our minds? Well, the, initially, mindfulness. Secondly, samadhi. Yeah, these are called the uh, being called sati adipateya, samadhi adipateya. We are making samadhi and sati in charge, and these become in charge of our mind. But first of all, let us look a little bit more about what drives these things. Yeah, why do these things beset us? So this is the the next thing the Buddha comes to here. Yeah? If they don't find anything worth approving, welcoming, or getting attached to in the source from which these arise. Yeah, these here, these are the perceptions and notions, proliferating perceptions and notions. These are these things, the source from which these perceptions arise. Yeah, what is the source from which these things arise? Yeah, and this you can. You can probably guess, uh, we're talking about craving, we're talking about uh, conceit and views, uh, and the source for pretty much everything bad in Buddhism uh, is a sense of self. Uh, and the sense of self is at the root of all of these kind of things. Uh, when we talk about the source, uh, that is where we want to look. And this is why the whole Buddhist idea is so much about uncovering uh, that illusion of the self. Uh, when you uncover that, when you rectify that problem, rectify that false and biased perception, then these things kind of uh, get sorted out. Uh, yeah, you don't no longer have this proliferation as a consequence. So when it says here that you don't find anything worth approving, welcoming, or getting attached to in that source, it means that you don't welcome the sense of self. You don't approve of the sense of self. You don't attach to the sense of self because you understand the sense of self is actually the problem. Uh, yeah, so, and this has many layers to it, yeah. As you deepen your meditation, uh, you start to see that things are impermanent, that they are unreliable. You see that you can give things up, uh, yeah, in your meditation. And you start, but that is already the beginning of understanding non-self. Understanding your own conditioning, understanding that you are the person you are because of your past, because of your conditioning. The more you can see that you are a victim of your conditioning, uh, the more you understand non-self. Just try to understand that. Okay, you know, uh, it's kind of very sweet. I come here and people offer me salmon. Yeah, it's kind of great because they know that I'm Norwegian. But actually, I'm not sure if I'm Norwegian or Australian anymore, but I'm kind of a mixture, I suppose. One of these bastards, you know, mixture, <laughs> mix of things. And uh, so and, but that's very sweet. So where does that come from? Obviously, it's condition. It's a very obvious kind of condition, yeah? And if you have some, if you come from a kind of Chinese cultural background, you probably like noodles. Like noodles, yeah, okay. <laughs> I know because we have, some of our monks also have are actually originally from Malaysia and other places, and they often they like noodles, yeah. They, so you can just see straight away. Yeah. So it's kind of obvious. Yeah, why is so? These things are just conditioning. Yeah, next life I may like noodles, and maybe you like salmon. Yeah, <laughs> see what happens because these things change. Yeah. We move about, so these things change all the time. And so the more you uncover these ideas, the more you look into them, the more you understand, the more you can see that you are this sum total of the cause and conditions working on you. So we do this gradually, gradually, gradually. In meditation, things become sim simpler and simpler. You're abandoning more and more things. And as you abandon things, you understand they cannot really be a self. Then you get to a really deep state of samadhi, like a jhana state, and then things are really abandoned in a very profound way. 
you start to see what this idea of non-self means much more profoundly. Eventually, you become a stream mentor. Yeah, this is what uh, kind of this is kind of where the path is heading. That is where you have the full understanding of non-self for the first time. Your view is rectified. You no longer have the sakaya diti. Yeah? It is the view of an existing person. Really, that's what it means: an existing personality. Yeah? Or an existing substance, as some people translate it. Uh, it can be rendered in many ways, uh, uh, sometimes personality view or ident identity view, but it is the sense that something inherently exists within us. Uh, that is overcome when you become a stream mentor. Your view is perfected. Uh, and then finally, you become an arahant. That's why you fully abandon all of this approving and welcoming, and getting attached to the sense of self. Uh, it's kind of strange. Yeah, the sense of self is so dear to us. Uh, I am this person, I have these qualities, this is me. It is so dear to us. And that's why when people want to kill us, we say, no, thank you. Yeah, no need, not yet, too early. I'm still going to hang in a few more years. A bit more work to do, not narrow hand yet. So we don't rather not die, yeah? And the sense of self is dear to us. We are dear to ourselves, and that's okay. We shouldn't be dear to ourselves, There's nothing wrong with that. But it is also a false kind of dearness. And that's where we, uh, you know, it's, it's very strange that something which is so close to us can actually be false. Uh, that is what the Buddha says. Uh, and the happiness you get by seeing through that falsehood uh, is far more powerful than the happiness that that falsehood can ever give you. Uh, in fact, that falsehood only gives you suffering, uh, which is strange, isn't it? Uh, it's weird. Uh, sense of self, all it gives is suffering. Uh, that's what the Buddha says. Uh, it's like turning the world upside down. Uh, so this is uh, what we are up against and what we are trying to do. Uh, so you can see why it is uh, a bit uh, complicated. Uh. So um, I think time for a sip of coffee. That was all. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, then the Buddha says, uh, just this is the end of the underlying tendencies to desire, repulsion, views, doubt, conceit, the desire to be reborn, and ignorance. These are the famous underlying tendencies, the, the anusayas. And it means that these things, even though they are temporarily absent in your mind, they can always come back depending on the circumstances. That's the idea of the underlying tendency. Yeah, so they're always there waiting to return again. Uh, and uh, arahanship, the uh, becoming, taking this all the way to the end, the giving up all this approving and things that we saw before in the sense of self, that is the ending of all those underlying tendencies. Uh, it's impossible for you to desire. It's impossible for you to desire to be reborn. Uh, that's kind of interesting right there. Yeah, the end of the underlying tendency to desire to be reborn. You cannot desire to be reborn again. Uh, and so the bodhisattva, uh, who becomes enlightened and carries on, it's impossible. Proof is right there. Yeah, you cannot become an arahant and say, okay, yeah, I'll hang out for the happiness of all beings. No, once you become an arahant, that's it. You are out of here. You don't want to be, you cannot possibly want to be reborn again. No more views, yeah, underlying tendency to views. What that means is not, it doesn't mean you don't have any views. It means you don't attach to those views. It means that if someone challenges you, you say, oh yeah, okay, challenge me if you like, that's okay. And the reason why you are not concerned is because you know, you don't have views, you have knowledge. Yeah, you have the full insight into things. That's kind of really reassuring. That's the advantage of being a stream mentor. If other people argue with you, you couldn't care less. Yeah, it's their problem, not yours. The conceit I am, yeah, the underlying tendency to conceit, this is often called the asmana nusaya in Pali, Asmi mana, asmi, I am. Mana is a conceit or, or pride. Does anyone know, do you know a little bit of Pali? Yeah, you don't know anything? Yes, who said yes? <laughs> no? Uh, okay. So I'd like to use a little bit of Pali terminology. I hope you will forgive me. Hopefully you will pick up a few words as we go along. Yeah? And uh, some of these are very interesting. Like the asmi man anusaya is a very interesting term. Asmi means I am. Mana is pride. So it's the conceit I am. And anusaya is the underlying tendency, the underlying tendency to the conceit I am. And this is what this is meant. So it means that you can no longer have 
the idea I am. The idea I am does not occur to you anymore now, which is kind of really strange and interesting, isn't it? Uh, and um, so, uh, but remember that the feeling I am, it can disappear temporarily. Uh, let's say you go into a deep state of samadhi, uh, you have a really kind of powerful samadhi, you go on an Ajahn Brahm retreat, Ajahn Brahm says, let go of everything. Uh, and one day you let go of everything, bang, you have never experienced so much bliss in your entire life. Everything disappears, all that's left is bliss. Yeah? And you kind of afterwards you cry and you're so happy because you don't, wow, this is just amazing what happened. You wouldn't believe it. Ajahn, I believe it, he will say. Yeah? And, you, <laughs> yeah? and then, but during that experience of supreme bliss, there can be no feeling or perception I am because it is beyond your ability to think anything. Yeah? Uh, but that doesn't mean that it is Nibbana, because after you come out, because it is an underlying tendency, it re-arises. And then you think back, oh yeah, that must have been the real me, yeah, that, that state of Samadhi. Yeah. And that's how it works. So, so, uh, so these are some of the ideas here. Yeah, desire and repulsion is just desire and ill, Ill will. Uh, doubt is the vichikicca. You don't have any doubt because you know, so that's why... You don't also hold on to views. And then ignorance is all kinds of uh, delusion. It's not really a good translation, ignorance. Uh, I don't agree with my good friend, Bhante Sujato. This is avidja. Ignorance it sounds a bit like, okay, you haven't been to university, yeah, or you haven't gone to school and learned your multiplication table or something like that. That's what it sounds a bit like. But that's not what ignorance is here. Avidja is lacking in the profound insight in Buddhism. So it is more like delusion. Uh, yeah, the uh, Te Vidya at the end of the Buddhist path, the three knowledges or three insights, as Ajahn Brahm calls it, and I really agree with Ajahn Brahm on that one. I think it's a good, very good point. The three insights, yeah, insight is the opposite of delusion, not the opposite of ignorance. Uh, the opposite of ignorance is knowledge, uh, and knowledge is um, not really such a good word for what we're trying to do here. Yeah. So. That's, these are the underlying tendencies. Yeah? They all go when you end the papancha, when you end the, the um, uh, delighting in the sense of self. This is the end of taking up the rod and the sword, the end of quarrels, arguments, and disputes, of accusations, divisive speech, and lies. This is where these bad, unskillful qualities cease without anything left over. So you can see here how this kind of goes back to uh, Dandapani at the beginning was a bit aggressive and a bit uh, disrespectful to the Buddha. Yeah? If you want to end all of these things, this is how you end it, uh, yeah? by ending papancha, by stopping the delighting in that sense of self. Uh, that is where all of these things come to an end. So uh, this is... Uh, yeah, so once you become an arahant, you can't argue anymore. Yeah? You can't have divisive speech. Yeah? So if you see an arahant who argues, yeah, then there is a problem. Yeah? Argumentative arahant, they are it's, it's a kind of, <laughs> it's what they call a, uh, what a oxymoron, they call that. Yeah? <laughs> so, um, yeah. So th this is, uh, so this is really what this, is about the path then, yeah, overcoming all the negative things, all the unskillful qualities. Uh, you overcome them in this way by ending papancha. Uh, so, uh, in other words, we have to develop our perceptions, change our perceptions so that they're not, are, they're not proliferating, but they are perceptions that are veridical, if you like, or true, and they, uh, um, they relate to the Buddha's teachings. Uh, Non-papancha perceptions are the are dhamma perceptions, uh, uh, seeing worlds in the right way. Uh, it stops the papancha, it blocks out the papancha. Why? Because they are exactly opposite uh, to the problems of the world, uh, like the perceptions of impermanence, etc., etc. All right. So, um, Okay, so let's have a, uh, I dropped my clock, let's have a short uh, meditation again and a short little break and do some questions and we can, uh, we'll carry on in a second now.
whole line. Good. So, um, any comments or questions or anything? Oh. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, hello, Ajahn. Um, yeah. Ajahn, just now you were you you were uh, you you said that the source of our perceptions is the illusion or sense of self. Um, I was a little bit confused because if if we say that um, this sense of this sense of self causes us to have our uh, uh, these um, unwise perceptions, yeah. then how does that reconcile with the fact that we have a responsibility to take ownership of of how of our actions, you know, to take the right actions, to have the right view? So I I, I find yeah. that. I, I, I seem to have this tension between the responsibility to, to have a right view, right action against this sense of self. Right, okay. So uh, the kind of the, the Buddhist idea is just that there is a, it's almost like a law. It's called, that's why it's called the, the law of karma. And uh, it is a law that works regarding whether there's a self or not. Uh, and it's a law that relates you know, intention to outcomes. And the outcomes are, you get bad rebirth or a good rebirth, you experience pain or experience happiness. Uh, and that law is just kind of a, it's a, it's a tendency of the mind to work. Uh, but the sense of self makes that law worse. Uh, yeah, so the sense of, because the, the sense of self is, um, you, we tend to judge ourselves. Uh, and so when you have a sense of self, you judge yourself more. And so actually that makes the karma worse. The more, the less wisdom you have, in other words, the worse is the kamma. The more wisdom you do, that's why the wisdom and all of these good spiritual faculties reduces the severity of kamma because you understand more the nature of things. A deluded person experiences more bad kamma. A wise person experiences less bad kamma. And that is the unfortunate reality. Yeah, and this is kind of how this, the, the, these things operate. And if you have a very clear idea that you are a victim of your conditioning. And you realize actually I shouldn't take so much responsibility. It doesn't make any sense to take responsibility uh, because yes, I may have done some bad things, but I did the bad things because I didn't have a choice. Yeah, it was actually very hard to avoid that doing those bad things. Uh, you are kind of forced into it. Uh, so we are responsible in the sense that we do our very best to overcome these things. Uh, but uh, we also understand that actually sometimes it is really out of our control. Actually, it's always out of control at the end of the day, but that some, only sometimes we can see it. Uh, so this is the weird thing, is that, is that uh, we, um, you know, we, we are responsible in the sense that we do our very best. Uh, at the same time, we are the victims of our conditioning. Uh, in the end, uh, you will not be able to see that fully because you have a sense of self. Uh, the sense of self will block you from being able to see that. Uh, the sense of self will take responsibility even when there is no responsibility. That's kind of the problem with the sense of self, right? Because the sense of self says, I am responsible. That's, good, that's what it feels like to us. So actually the sense of self gets in the way of uh, forgiveness. It blocks forgiveness. That's one of the problems of sense of self. And this is why it's so useful to see through it. So, uh, you know, responsibility in a sense, yes, but in another sense, no. So it is about how we use these words and how we look at them that matters. Uh, so if you if you think that there is no responsibility, that means I can do whatever I want. That's also wrong. Yeah, <laughs> that also doesn't work. Yeah, so you have to see these things correctly. Yeah, yeah. It's a bit tricky. You have to kind of, uh, uh, you know, in the in the ultimate sense, there is no personal responsibilities. But the problem is that the law of karma works regardless. Uh, and so you will kind of bear results, even though you're not responsible. That's kind of the, the really terrible thing about it, yeah? And uh, so, uh, yeah. So agile uh, means we are not in control then? Absolutely not, yeah. You, you, maybe just because you hold the microphone doesn't mean you're in control. <laughs> <laughs> I have more control. Yeah, no control, <laughs> that's right. <Yeah. laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, Ajahn, uh, following what you have mentioned, so does it mean that for someone who has dementia, uh, they don't know what they're doing? And how do you explain their karma if they do something which they forget after that? Yeah. Uh, the implication of their karma 
they yeah. just forget about it. So what's going to happen to these people? What's going to happen to them? That's, yeah. Um, well, it depends on at the time of doing it. What is their intention at that time? That's kind of the critical thing, right? So when you have dementia, maybe you don't really know what you're doing. Yeah? And if you don't know what you're doing, then there is no karma. It's just kind of the, it's almost like a robot doing things because of the past or whatever. But maybe they have a little bit of a clear moment and then they have a bad intention and then they forget about it afterwards. Yeah? And then it's still bad karma. And then what happens is that when you die, yeah, well, this is kind of one of those very interesting things about the death process. And you, there is a very famous, uh, well known um, uh, concept called terminal lucidity. Yeah? In, uh, have you heard about that? Yeah. And it's what happens when someone comes to the very end of their life. They had dementia, they had been completely out of it, haven't recognized the family for a decade or two or whatever. They come to the very last time of the 15 minutes of their life and suddenly they become lucid. And they recognize everyone. Yeah. Oh, how are you, son? Yeah. How are you? You know. And and it's like, uh, where have you been for the last twenty years or whatever? And so that and so and of course, once that happens, then maybe you do remember that uh, time when you did something bad, right? Even when you had dementia, because you gained clarity again, uh, and then it may actually have an effect on your karma. So what I would recommend is that you know have get very good habits before you get dementia. <laughs> But when you get dementia, you have been some full of loving kindness, all these kind of things, yeah? So you don't have a problem with it. Yes. How do, does one strike the balance between responsibility and wisdom? Because as a lay person, sometimes it's kind of quite difficult to differentiate it all. You know what I mean? Uh, <clears throat> so how do you balance between this responsibility and wisdom? Huh? Yeah, because as a, I suppose with practice, but then sometimes it's very difficult to draw a line between how you feel responsible and how yeah. does wisdom come in. Right, okay, I, see. I think I see what you mean, yeah, okay. Um, I think the, uh, I, I, it, it's kind of very gradual, you know, and uh, so you kind of, this thing kind of uncovered very gradually, but I would say that uh, Take, take, take all the sila and all of these things very serious. Sila is like morality, yeah? The idea to be kind, the idea to live well. Take these things very, very seriously. These are really, really important things. Uh, and uh, don't, you don't have to think about it as being responsible or whatever. Just think about, okay, kindness is good, yeah? When I'm kind, I feel good about myself. When I'm kind, then people around me feel good about themselves. Uh, so it is always a very positive thing. It supports everyone. Uh, and so think of it more like that. And uh, then sometimes you will fail. Yeah? Sometimes you will may say something that wasn't quite right or whatever. And if you didn't, it would be a miracle because we all, all do that pretty much. Uh, that is when your wisdom starts to grow and you start to be able to forgive yourself. Uh, when you start out because you think, oh, I'm responsible, you can't really forgive yourself because I did it. Yeah? It's me who did it. But maybe it isn't you who did it. Maybe it is a kind of this cause and conditions coming together. Uh, and you start to see this more and more that actually, you know, I, this is how I was conditioned as a child. This is how society, I had a teacher who was like this to me. I, you know, I, even in past lives, maybe I did dodgy things. This is a habit from the past that comes into this life. And you start to see that all this conditioning is actually making you to be who you are now. And this makes, means that sometimes you react and do things that are not right. It's not really because you really want to do them. If I asked you, do you ever want to become angry? Probably you say, no, I don't really want to be angry. But even if you don't want to, you still become angry. Why is that? Because you have no control. That's the reality of it. Uh, yeah, it's a conditioning happening. Uh, you can't stop these things. They're very powerful forces. Uh, and so you, uh, you learn gradually. And as you learn these things, you start to see, yeah, I am conditioned. Uh, all of these things have worked on me. These are habits from the past. When I see this person, every time I see this person, I get irritated. Uh, you know what I mean? There are some people who, we are all irritating, yeah? and we all get irritated by others. Uh, yeah, every one of us is irritating. Yeah? <laughs> yeah, because why? We, because we, and the reason is very simple because uh, we, other people have different perceptions. We have one perception, so we irritate each other, like in a kind of an endless way. Yeah, this is the way, this is the way life is. Uh, and uh, you start to uncover all of these conditionings and things. You start to understand that actually at the end of the day, 
I don't really have much choice or much ability to do things differently. I'm trapped in this way of doing things. Slowly it kind of emerges. And then as you do that, uh, you start to be able to forgive yourself. This is the kind of the consequence of that, because how can you take responsibility? How can you say, I am to blame? If you are the victim of the conditioning of the past, you can't. Then forgiveness happens. This is the beautiful, incredibly beautiful and powerful result of the idea of non-self. So don't, so just live to the best of your ability. And then gradually you learn how to, um, to forgive yourself more. And when you forgive yourself more, lo and behold, you also forgive other people more at the same time, because these things go together. Yeah. yeah. Please, yeah. Yeah, Ajahn, at the end of your sharing, right, you mentioned about the opposite of Papancha. What is, what's the Pali words for that opposite of Papancha? Nipapancha. Sorry? Nipapancha. Nipapancha. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> that was easy. Okay, let's stop, let's stop there anywhere because uh, we need to, to carry on with the next one. Huh? Yeah. Yeah, the Arahant is Nipapancha. Yeah. Can you find Nipa Pancha? Are you looking for it? Looking for it? Yeah? Okay. <laughs> it's in the sutta, Nipa Pancha. And you have the uh, Papanchate, it means that you are you are proliferating, yeah. And uh, yeah. <laughs>